I actually like now uh, traveling with Rob because I'm like, Rob, where are we going next? <laughs> <laughs> I'm your corporate Sherpa, Dave. What do you mean? Yeah, it the gives one me who's... a sense of security. <laughs> Welcome to Cloud Realities, a conversation show exploring the practical and exciting alternate realities that can be unleashed through cloud-driven transformation. I'm Dave Chapman. I'm Shao Kuzal. And I'm Rob Kernahan. So Rob, what are you confused about this week? Uh, well, Dave, I, it's cryptocurrency, isn't it? I'm confused. Is it a thing or is it not? So on the one hand, you got the legacy financial institutions telling us all not to invest. It's a fad. And then on the other hand... It's been around for a long time. It clearly has some value to some people. And now the likes of Elon Musk are creating currencies and, you know, Tesla allowed you to buy parts of the car, Bitcoin for a bit and things like this. So I'm stuck. Is it a massive Ponzi scheme that's going to collapse one day and everybody's going to cry? Or is it actually the future of the economy? And I don't know. And I'm confused by it. So I I think it's a fair thing to be confused by. And I actually wish I had the answer to that. But I do remember once I was chatting to somebody <laughs> this this is going to sound bad i apologize for saying this before i even get going but like the i was chatting to this guy over a couple of beers and asked him a similar question this is about a year and a half ago and he gave me a very compelling answer as to why it wasn't the ponzi scheme and that it was good the only downside to the story is i can't remember what the answer is <laughs> So we remain also, confused. Also very confusing, it like Dave. You had, you, but very it confusing. sounds like you had my answer there. It was very compelling. I was getting up. Oh, Dave's going to give me some insight. And then you end with that. Fred not. There is an answer to it. And, you know, maybe someone can enlighten us at some point. But without further ado, though, let's introduce our guest this week. Joining us this week is Alex Log, IT Director of Product Engineering at the Royal Mail. Alex, it is great to have you on the show. Why don't you just introduce yourself and just say a little bit about what you do? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so I'm Alex Lorke. I'm the IT Director for Product Engineering at the YML. I've been with YML for 14 plus years and I'm really, really passionate about the YML. It's it's a brand that is that I fell in love with. I thought I was going to join the organization to do, you know, do three year stint and I'm off to the next thing. And here I am still many, many, many years later. And it is an organization that as I feel really proud and passionate about and, uh, and, and to work for because it is a very engaging brand. It is something that you can touch and feel and everybody has something to say about it. So the thing that's that's really made me stick with the organization is the opportunity to really be a part of building software capability and software product for the organization. So today I look after a team of around 500 people that built a software product for Rymel and they are the strategic components of the organization are the bits that make us compete and win in the market. And that's from .com all the way through to the device that the postie holds in their hands when they visit you at the doorstep. And, and that also includes two pure play software development shops that are called Storefeed and Intersoft. And I have the privilege to be on their boards as the as a non-executive director and chair for the organization. So, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell. All right, shall we swing into action on the Royal Mail Group? So, Alex, why don't you, for the listeners maybe who are outside of the UK and don't know the history of Royal Mail, why don't you give us a bit of background on, you know, such an amazing and long established organization? Happy to do so. So the Royal Mail is, is an organization I think we all engage with on a daily basis, whether you receive a letter or a parcel, whether you walk past a pillar box or a, a van drives past you. So it's a, it's a very engaging brand. It's, it's something that's that's kind of part of the fabric of the UK. And, and I guess as an organization, it's more than 500 years old. So it's an organization that has evolved with the country. So amazing amount of heritage. Not many organizations can claim that level of depth, right? I mean, it goes back to sort of, you know, horse and carriage days and even probably before that. Well, allegedly, it was Henry VIII who birthed the, the Postal Service. And the reason he did it is he wanted to spy on on the correspondence between other <laughs> sort of players in, in the UK. And, and, and so he introduced that so they could then secretly open the mail and, and read everybody's correspondence. So I don't know whether that's myth and legend or whether there's some truth on it, but uh, so that, that appears to be the heritage of, of the Postal Service. Service. And the Royal Mail has been you know, on the forefront of innovation throughout the 500 year history with the introduction of the postcode, for example, uh, something that, that, that didn't exist. The, uh, the universal service obligation, which is the delivering an item to anywhere in the country for one 
price to any uh, any destination. And, and it's something that actually totally empowered poorer or less connected parts of the country to to, to come together and, and, and operate on an equal footing, whether that is through mail uh, in terms of letters or whether that's actually sending parcels and packets. And so if I'm a business and I'm an Elta Hebrides, I can still send an item at the same price as someone in central London, so I'm not disadvantaged. So so I said that's a really important element of actually making the economy circulate right. um, and allowing everybody in the UK to be equal, which is really important. Yes, it levels the communications playing field, doesn't it? It does. And, and starts to sort of underpin society and sort of bring elements of society together to create like a bigger conversation than there would have been possible before. Yeah. It was like the first universal internet, but 500 years ago, where anybody could communicate with anybody for the same price. It's a really nice sort of levelling of connecting society story, isn't it? 500 years ago, we brought society together through letters. Yeah, and, and actually the parallel you draw there is is, is really important. So we, we used to, as an organisation pre-privatisation, to have a postal regulator who was specifically there to, to look after the universal service obligation, which is the same price anywhere, six days a week. And we found that in the early... 2000s that our main competition was actually the the email and the internet. Um, it wasn't other us, other postal organisations or, or or the postal industry at large. It was the telecommunications industry. So as part of the privatisation, we also switched regulator. We're now regulators part of Ofcom. Uh, as a result, we are in the same bracket as, as telecommunications organisations, and we find ourselves in the similar regulatory regime. And considerations of the regulator are more more level handed between what it means for us to, to be secure and, and connect connected versus what it means to telecommunications. You know, for me personally, when I joined the organization 15 years ago, this was the first big major transformation that I saw the organization go through when when, when really the, the the adoption of email, the digitization of the bank statement, all, all those things were starting to seriously impact letters volumes. Mm. So if you go back 20 years ago, the Royal Mail was handling 20 billion items a year. Today, that's 7 billion items. So in the last 20 years, our core letters business has declined by about 60%. Right. And we're forecasting that um, the letters business will plateau out somewhere around 4 billion. So there's another 50% reduction, which we're likely to experience in the next, you know, five to 10 years. And that's a, it's a massive structural change, right? If you look, if you look at, uh, at any organization that's, that, that's going to operate at, you know, 20 or 30% of what it is op- used to operate at. Right. And in particular being a fixed asset operator like we are, you have to physically move mail through the networks. No, it's like literally the lifeblood of the network, isn't it? Is, is items going through it. But I wonder what, the pivot here must be into the world of packages and parcels, and I suspect accelerated by the kind of move online that the pandemic, uh, yes. the, the pandemic impact had. Yeah, and, and I think that brings us to the heart of the transformation. So we just talked about this decline of, of the letters volume and the structural change that that brings to the organization, which is a cost on play and an automation play for, for a lot of the things we do in, in, in the letters network. Then you look at the parcel and the shape of a parcel is very different to the shape of letter. Right, and right. so while it's parcels there's growth and we've seen 10 percent plus growth year and year the pandemic has been insane growth that we were 30 40 percent growth rates during those two years but the parcel is a very different shape so a letter the customer my customer for a letter is the doorstep it's the letter box i drop the letter into and that's like a stateless transaction almost Correct. isn't it's, it you know it's open 24 7 um, there's no human interaction. Yeah. I don't really care yeah. who actually in the household is receiving the item. I can walk up the garden pass, drop it in, and I'm out again, right? Really right. quick in and out. Right. Parcel, completely different experience. The parcel experience is, is with the recipient, so I need to hand it over more often than not to a particular person. Mm. There's a scanning event, there's a, there's a call interaction, so there's a whole user experience. And my expectation as a customer is, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, within a certain time window, I'm going to know when my package is arriving and I'm going to sort of, I'm going to set an expectation around that and I'm going to sort of plan my day around that. So that's very different, isn't it, to uh, my letter's going to arrive tomorrow, you know, and, and, and it's just going to drop through the door and I don't actually have to do anything about that. Yes, and that then takes us to the sort of digital aspect of the transformation, which is uh, not only am I switching my network to to be a, 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 you know targeted towards a person, 
uh, and this this interaction, but this interaction is digitally enabled because mm. as a recipient, I want to know where is the item, when is it coming, who's it coming, who's it being delivered by, can I change my delivery preference? So I want to interact via a mobile device, I want to interact via my mobile app, and that requires a connected digital experience end to end through the supply chain. And, and there's been a massive change in that experience in the last decade because it used to be the surprise parcel, you know, it's coming, keep the curtains twitching, are they here yet, are they here yet, to all interaction, it's coming, this time window, the beer, bang, done, done. The transaction has become, you know, you were scared to leave your house in case they turned up and ran away again. But now it's like, you know, you, you get this much higher level of certainty. So peace of mind and the experience is so much better. And it feels much more centralized around the individual and their experience than centralized around the logistics set up where it used to be. So uh, it's definitely massively changed from my perspective. Yeah, and that change is, is really, really hard to replicate mm. for us as a, as a, as a male or organization, as, a, as an organization that carries letters. So, so we, we're, we're coming from a letters business that used to carry parcels, and now we've become a parcel Yeah, and all of business. a sudden, your, your competition's changed, hasn't exactly. it? Exactly. And so, so the, the pure play like courier businesses who only do parcels, their networks have been optimized this way yeah. all the way through and, and they've been driving the innovation in terms of the user experience and particularly some of the digital natives like Amazon have been really investing very heavily into giving the best you know, user experience at the doorstep. For us, it, it's do that whilst managing the cost out at the same time, right? So, so, so for us, it's been a, a 2 billion, around about 2 billion investment to get our network changed to, to, to be no longer letters orientated, to be parcels orientated. Wow. And the delivery chain from, from a recipient, uh, sorry, from a sender to recipient, which for a letter is about a seven step process of handling the item through delivery offices and mail centers compared to a parcel to optimize delivery network, which is a three to maximum four step activity, i.e. aggregating straight into Superhub, down to delivery networks or delivery offices and then to the recipient. So, so that's 50% less handling so can you think in terms of cost of sending 2 million parcels a day, did you handle it seven times or do you handle it four times? Uh, and then the, the investment required to give the digital experience in terms of the connectivity between the machineries that's reading the labels and notifying out you know, to customers where the item is and then the visibility in the final mile where the item is in, in you know, routing through traffic uh, with the postie and having the item in their bag, et cetera, et cetera. So, or connecting all that up into a digital experience that then allows you on your mobile phone to see, oh yeah, uh, Posty Alex is coming you know, in two hours to see me at my doorstep. That is a completely different capability to where we come from. And that's the convergence though, which we've seen over the last decade, which is GPS integrated with OT, integrated with IT, allowing you to give a unified experience, isn't it? It's like that has definitely matured, which makes it I wouldn't say easy, but more practical to integrate to get all the information together. Just as a note on this, Alex, before you answer that very good question, uh, converged technologies is one of Rob's favorite things. <laughs> so, like, literally. Oh, we, we, I we knew can, this was coming. As soon as I asked the question, I thought, oh, I know what Dave's going to say. But we can be stood, like, <laughs> in the street trying to get an Uber, and Rob is <laughs> holding his phone in his hand, holding Uber up to me, going, Look, you can see the car coming. It's converged technology in action. I'm like, I know, Rob, but the irony of it is he can't use Uber. So when, <laughs> so, so he's like, I'm no good at using it though. Yeah. We, we stood there and there was a taxi rank over there. So I'm like, let's just go and get a taxi because there's one right there. And Rob's like, no, no, I can't because I'm, you know, I've, I've got Uber. And then I'm going, but you haven't even notified a driver yet, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> they don't know that they need to come it's converged technology is not that good yet <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about converged technology and i want to use it dave we'll leave it there all right we'll, yeah. let's leave there. <laughs> alex sorry <laughs> mate no that's yeah. all right and, and, and it's, it's actually really really uh you get good com comparison to 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 where we are as a business where the the pda which we call the, the postal digital assistant right it's the mobile phone just as a rugged device it, it is really the lifeblood and the, the heart and soul of the of the posties out in the street right so that's our channel of communication into into our frontline colleagues there's about eighty thousand of them as already said we're kind of delivering around about 40 million letters and about 2 million parcels every day to 32 million addresses in the uk 
event. And so the logistics challenge, you know, is very, very similar to an Uber, you know, to, to the Uber organization in terms of sending, you know, connecting consumers with, with, with taxis. So for us, it's connecting mail items with our recipients. Mm. Um, and so, so we have actually quite a, quite a significant technical challenge around both from a network perspective in terms of, you know, my post needs to be connected to, right. uh, to a connected network. If they're in the Outer Hebrides or in, in London, um, the challenges are different. In the Outer Hebrides, is, uh, is network coverage. In, in a central London, it's the urban footprint of high rise yeah. and others that stops the GPS accuracy. But increasingly, what we do with the posted device, it's a, it's for us, it's an Android, um, Android device that runs applications that we build for our colleagues using the Microsoft architecture and, and runs as uh, behind the scenes. So, so that's of the, the footprint. It's a .NET framework. And, um, and we, we absolutely exploit the, the capabilities of the device in order to give the best digital experience. What has been the challenges in the technical evolution into being able to do that, Alex, from, from what was probably you know, a, a fairly substantial logistics support, even in the sort of postal iteration yep. of the Royal Mail versus the digital platform and package iteration of the Royal Mail? What's that journey been like from a tech perspective? Yeah, it's it's been it's been immense. I mean, you know, just in, in you know, whilst I've been here, we uh, about six years ago, we, we started to seriously see um, see some challenges in terms of the capability of the device, which means. No. Device capability is a constraining factor, and, and we're constantly looking at, um, you know, how far can we push a device. Um, but so, so the last change we made, made about um, two, two years ago now. Uh, but prior to that, uh, the the previous device we had, we we're seriously running out of memory. We we're seriously running out of processing and, and, and compute power just on the device. So, we, we were constantly optimizing just the application footprint on the device and stop memory leakages, etc., to to just kill the, the the user experience. So, so that was a period where we were pushing really hard and in, in, in replicating and um, you know mar- market features that we desperately needed to to give a give to. Our our frontline colleagues and our consumers, but we were constantly being constrained. Since then, luckily, touch wood. So we've uh, the, the the more recent generation of device that we've got in the in the field at the moment, which is it's just you know just over a, a year and a half old, um, has got the the memory and the capacity, um, the processing power, the screen size that is that's that's very a- akin to a, a modern mobile device. Hmm. And we are on, on, you know, I think we're, we're at the moment we're working on upgrade, and that will open up some additional capability and functionality. So, so, so feeling feeling good in terms of the, the technical foundation. It must have brought about a very different set of conversations, though, because all of a sudden, from a, a tech and digital implementation perspective, you know, there must be a much bigger conversation around customer and employee experience, for example, than there was probably even pre-pandemic I would think and I asked that question one because I you know I, I'm interested to hear it from a Royal Mail perspective but also I think experience-led transformation can often be the most powerful transformation that an organization can go through because it immediately starts to deliver value to both your customer and your internal employees and 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 therefore not only is is it good to upgrade that experience but also that then starts to lead to stronger prioritization of digital change and and, and I'm guessing uh, increased productivity particularly from an employee perspective yeah that, 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 a couple of things there's a, there's a there's an interesting story so during the last autumn strike action during that period when, when there was a lot of staff and availability to get product fulfilled um, you know we as, as, as managers and and uh, back office staff were helping out in the front line. Mm. And a couple of my uh, engineers were out uh, delivering, um, and they felt that the process of, of how you load parcels in the van wasn't wasn't really wasn't really that that helpful um, for someone who, who doesn't really know the the geography and doesn't do this as a daily as a daily task, right? So, so posties who who do this every day, they know all the addresses on the top of the head. They look at the parcel and kind of go, right, these ones need to be the beginning of my round. These ones at the end, I'll just chuck it all in the van and I'm off I go. Mm-hmm. Now, imagine you as a um, as a as a software developer um, having to do that. The logistics challenge of taking 200 parcels out on the route, which you don't know where you're going, right. is really, 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 really challenging. So, so um, the guys went like, "Well, I'm not having this." Um, they literally go, "Okay, there's a better way of doing this. I'm not going to build a little mini app that allows me to scan the items into se- into segments and then I'll load them according to that." They went back in the office the next day, did the prototype. A week later, we had rolled out a a, um, a, a mini app um, that that allowed 
users to build uh, to build a manifest that was zone based loading into the van, and that was the was instantly adopted because you know all of us you know sort of casual managers workers uh, you know were absolutely loving this feature and functionality when like yes we want that happy days and that's become you know you know w- w- one of the capabilities now being used in, in by 80,000 colleagues on a daily basis that's classic engineer thinking though isn't it it's like the see a problem i'm going to automate this and make it easier for the user also doing that job builds massive empathy with what the you know the day to day post he has to do so through that experience everybody's got a better experience so negative to very po- po- positive and I really like the way that digitally engineering a solution you know, in a couple of days and it works you know that is cloud native approaches in action isn't it business problem realized you know proof point roll out scale and it shows you the power of of, of user driven design, doesn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, and, it, does. uh, it does. and you know, one of the things we've done as a as a as a direct action, you know, you know falling from the from the strike action, um, is that all our engineers who come on, on on into the teams will have the opportunity to go up with the post to be out on the walk. Right, um, yeah. It just experience that, um, and it just brings that intimacy in terms of when we build solutions that we we, we know how they're being used to the front line. Um, having said that, I'd, I'd like to do more of that. I'd like to to be to get even closer to to my frontline colleagues um, in in the way we set our process. So we still have a lot of sort of project processes that kind of get in the way. And um, so for us, one of the strategic intents is to to be to be more you know product development orientated in the way we right. we, we set up our delivery chain uh, and our change chain. So so, but yeah, I think we're on the right trajectory there. So Alex, we just went through that use case of building up in a week. Was there anything on that cloud native journey that sticks out for you? Major point of learning, something that you went, oh, no, we need to do this differently or a significant experience that sort of accelerated everything in, in the mind's eye? Yeah, so for, for me as a, as, as, a, as a leader and as a technology leader, it's a, it's a quite defining uh, moment in my career that, that I consider quite pivotal. Um, so in 2015 and 2016, so we were looking at, um, at go-to-market strategies to compete against the marketplaces from a logistics perspective. I won't bore you with the details, but uh, we, we felt that we, we weren't able to, to deliver the step change in our digital capability required to compete effectively building that in-house. So, so we chose to um, acquire by, um, digital peer play businesses, Storefeeder and Intersoft, in fairly short succession, who bring different capability. One's more oriented towards marketplace um, integration, the other one more around multi carrier integration for logistics yeah. and, and, and complex supply chains. And when I engaged with, with organizations that were entrepreneurial in mindset, quite small and nimble operators, and, and Storefeeder itself was born in the cloud on, on Azure, my eyes kind of reopened after you know, a career at that stage of or nearly 15, 20 years of just being a more commercial oriented technology leader mm-hmm. um, to actually get him back into the the, the, the craft of, of building applications and software. Alex, that, that really resonates with me because I had a very similar epiphany with this stuff. And yeah. in a lot of ways, it was even more basic. So I was, at the time I was working uh, in government, I was in DWP and I was actually getting much more into like business change and as you say, commercial leadership. And frankly, I'd lost a lot of love for sort of IT because it was all just about SAP deployments and yes, yes, it was, it was, re- it was like supplier management. Buy not build, right? B- yeah, building yeah, yeah. stuff was bad, right? So there, you, there was you just wouldn't... nothing creative happening in Correct. it. Yeah, to- totally. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I, 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 I was sort of at the. Uh, I was getting really, really good at being, 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 you know, a lawyer and, and, uh, yeah. and a commercial contract, negotiator, contract, guy. contract manager, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and writing PowerPoint slides. So, so yes, yeah, so that wasn't really actually that fulfilling. A great my uh, moment was, and this I, this sounds ridiculously trivial, <laughs> but like my wife had, uh, like I, I hadn't bothered with even iPhones and stuff like that, and my wife got an iPhone four. So that dates exactly when this was. It was just when the iPhone 4 came out. And I picked up the iPhone and my wife was like, oh, could you set that up for me? And I'm like, oh, like deep intake of breath. Like, okay, I really don't want to do this because like setting computers up at the time was just like the, the most awful experience. So like that's my mindset going in, as you say, like my day-to-day job, even though I was in IT, was actually way more about supply and management and stuff like that. So I sat down with the iPhone 4. And I opened the mail application and it was, it was connecting the iPhone 4 to Gmail was my, was my moment of like light bulb. It was like, oh my God, 
like I can't I literally can't believe that that was just worked yeah. was it was it uh, yeah. oh my god I can't believe I didn't have to do anything yeah. other than click and, two buttons and just yeah. how architecturally how different that was you know it's like like th- from that point onwards I'm like right I'm back I'm, ba- I'm back on you know what I mean it's like I'm, I'm suddenly fascinated by technology again yeah yeah exactly and, and and so i had that i had that epiphany working with the subsidiaries and um and the, the challenge that we that we were tasked to do which was um to well, at the time we created this new brand or channel which is called click and drop which was a twinkle in our eyes um in in 2015 and the um, you know the, the cto managing director of, of, of the storefeeder subsidiary and myself um, we, we created this vision around building this this application and we, we took it to, to market in 13 weeks i was an mvp it was it was fledgling product but we were working to the all the principles of Cloud first, continuous delivery, trial and learn, put the customer in the middle. These were these were the cultural values that, that store feeder and Intersoft, you know, just living and breathing. And that product or that channel with click and drop, over the last eight years, we've gone from you know, in, in, with this subsidiary, from from a team of ten people sitting in the back in a, in a really crappy um, warehouse to to a hundred people organization that's that's built, you know, building and continually evolving one of our most critical channels in our uh, you know e-commerce and, and marketplace seller space. And with the customers loving it, they use this application not because they have to, because it's Roy Mellon, it's monopolistic. It's it's because there's choice. They want to use it, they love it. Um, they give great ra- ratings for the application, and it's such a different experience. So, look, a fascinating story from the days of highwaymen and coaching horses, all the way through to modern delivery chains, product orientation, and Rob's favorite thing, converged technology, Woo-hoo! is uh, just a, a fascinating historical story. I wonder, Alex, just to maybe bring our conversation to a bit of a close today. Pitches into the future, like what, what are you guys looking at next in terms of taking such an amazing organization into even more modern times? Yeah, uh, so I think there are some, some things around so when you look at it as from, from a business perspective. Um, so we've we recently started uh, drone-based delivery into into um, you know, the outer edges of the network where actually for safety reasons, um, you know, we take um, you know, pa- parcels to islands, to remote islands, for example, and, and during poor weather, um, you know, that yeah, our colleagues are physical safety is at risk or sometimes that means actually mail doesn't go through for uh, for a couple of weeks if, if there's really poor weather conditions and imagine there's a there's an emergency with regards to someone falling ill or or medicines being required so so we launched uh, we launched a drone based delivery into those regions or, or geographies um, and it's something that we, we we think will will probably grow in our usage but is unlikely to come into the core network. So if you look at quite a number of organizations who are playing and trialing drone-based delivery, whether that's um, drones on the ground, uh, vehicles or airborne vehicles, I think the interaction with the with the wider um, social fabric um, uh, is quite challenging, particularly in an urban context. But that, that's an interesting area. Um, there's a lot of future gazing around um, drone-based delivery. Um, and, and in certain um, environments, um, they're quite well-controllable environments. I think I think we'll see more of that. And, and of course, automation under the roof is also one where there's continued innovation that's not as visible to, to maybe to the recipient and the public eye. But in terms of the investment we take in our super hubs, which are highly automated, massive infrastructures that basically allow us to, to sort tens of thousands of items every uh, every minute. Um, th- those are the kind of scale factors that allow us to deliver a reliable digital service to, to, to our customers. Jack, what have you been looking at this week? So each week I do some research on related ideas in transformation and tech. And this week I thought we should take a look at the impact of AI and machine learning on logistics operations in post offices. So AI and machine learning are really changing the logistics operations of post offices on a worldwide scale. Increasing efficiency, reducing the cost and improving the customer experience. So predictive maintenance, route optimization and customer service are just a couple of areas where AI and ML are making a huge impact. But these technologies are also being used to detect fraudulent activities, which will improve the security and maintain a high level of trust with customers. So a question, do you think that AI and machine learning 
really has the potential to change the logistics industry, enabling faster and more accurate delivery of packages and mail. Yeah, so this is really, uh, really quite an important topic. So, so AI, I think, so I'll come to back la- a little bit later. I think AI is a little bit maybe opaque, but machine learning is a really important topic for us um, and an area where we've actually t- taken quite a bit of investment. So, so, so one problem is to give you one problem space, which is our, our lorries, which are trunking, you know, parcels and, 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 and letters between mail centers and delivery offices. Um, you see them in the, in the dark of night, you're traveling up the motorway. Um, so it's a, quite a significant network that we operate. And when there's traffic and congestion, um, when, when highway agencies close down uh, motorways, um, um, our lorry drivers have to reroute. And, and you say, well, that's not a problem. I'll just check on my Google Maps or my, 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 uh, you know, Apple ma- Maps and, and I'll, I'll take a, a diversion. Oh, don't use Apple Maps. They'll get lost. Use Google Maps. Yeah, well, um, Dave always tells me to have an opinion. There's an opinion. There, there are the vendors who provide the service. <laughs> uh, I, I hasten to add, but um, of course, what none of those do, they are they are not they're, they're not optimized for HDB traffic, right? So you get routed through roads that have low bridges, um, mm-hmm. and you have lorries smashing into railway lines. Now, the cost of of, of smashing into a railway line is, I think, something like ten thousand pounds a minute. Um, in, oh it, God, it's, that expensive! It's absolutely, holy insane. moly! Yes, so so you do not want to do that. You do not want your lorry to drive into into a, a, a railway bridge. Um, oh. And you know, so that's crazy. But but even if you if you crash somewhere else, you you know, that that mail is just stuck. And so we 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 saw the problem space, and particularly during periods of, of high activity from the highways agency in terms of making uh, you know road closures during the night, which is when we drive when we drive um, a, a lot of our traffic, and then you miss um, you, know, you miss the connect, connect connections into you know into air traffic or other things, and suddenly a whole bunch of mail doesn't get to the customer and right. you fail yeah. our quality of service targets and then we'll get fined, et cetera, right? So, um, so what we did, we, we run some machine learning on, uh, on, on historical routes. So we, we collect up all of the footprint, um, the, the GPS footprint from, from Rory's because they're connected through um, telematics systems and we, all that data is, is, is sucked up into GCP. Um, our GCP platform, and then we run machine learning algorithms that say, right, um, to go from A to B. You know, over the last six months, which are the most effective routes? If this one's closed down, which is the next uh, most efficient route to go through? And you have the confidence that those routes, which have been travelled often and are the short, shortest, fastest routes, are also safe because they've been accident-free. Um, and that was a really easy way for us to just basically use her histor- historical data to do our own route optimization. Um, that's that's specific for lorries. I mean, just in that one little case study, you can see the potential of what you've been looking at, right, Shaq? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I never realized that the normal routes weren't optimized for those lorries. No. No, no, they, they don't. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the early days of, of, of Google Maps, we have some lovely photographs um, of, of vans stuck in, you know, between Look narrow roads and under bridges yeah. and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. not pretty. <laughs> Yeah. So where I live is one of the most hit railway bridges in Britain, rather humorously, and I have actually seen an articulated lorry drive straight into it, and it does cause utter bedlam and chaos on the road network. Trains have to stop everything. So, so yeah, uh, getting that right, that's got to be a major plus. And well. also bad marketing, right? If that yeah. happens all the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, everybody takes a photo and you, the company's name's down the side of the truck, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's not ideal. Well, look, a, amazing conversation today. Alex, thank you so much for your time and insight it's been great talking to you you're welcome now we end every episode of this podcast by asking our guests what they're excited about doing next and that could be you know it's friday got a great restaurant book tonight looking forward to going there or it could be something you're looking forward to in your professional life so alex what are you looking forward to doing next? It definitely isn't uh, isn't my professional life. Um, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy my professional life. What I really look forward to is um, is to go wing foiling. Um, hopefully this weekend, although the wind's not looking that great. Uh, so uh, last year I picked up wing foiling as a new what, what? Know, sport. Wing foiling? Is it? Yeah. So it's it's basically it's a, it's like a stubby wind surfboard or, or surfboard mm-hmm. with the hydrofoil underneath it and you carry a, <gasps> a inflatable wing uh, with you that then propels you up on, on, onto the hydrofoil. Is that the one you have to bounce up and down on and it gets going or is that a different one? If the wind's not strong enough then there's a, that's a way of, of pumping yourself up onto the hydrofoil which requires very little effort to keep you going um, but getting out of the water onto the hydrofoil that requires that bit of effort, yes. Yeah, is it as cool. difficult as it looks? It looks immensely difficult to me. It's- uh, I, 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 it's hard, hard to gauge. Um, so I, I think that, that getting up on the hydrofoil is quite hard. 
once you're up and you got the basic balance, it, it's it's actually very easy. Um, having said that, the progression is much much faster than it was on on windsurfing. So mm. I, you know, I'm I, year, the second season. I'm already doing jumps and aerial stuff, and that took me about 10, 15 years on a windsurf board. So oh, so I think I think the progression is much much faster on it. So oh, it's cool. probably well, easier. That's great fun. Nice. Yes. That is a brilliant one. That is a brilliant one. Well, look, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. A huge thanks to our guest this week, Alex. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks also to our sound and editing wizards, Ben and Louis, our fabulous producer, Marcel, and of course, to all of our listeners. We're on LinkedIn and X, Dave Chapman, Rob Kernahan, and Xiao Kizal. Feel free to follow or connect with us. And please get in touch if you have any comments or ideas for the show. And of course, if you haven't already done that, rate and subscribe to our podcast see you in another reality next week